good morning everybody. Thank you for joining me today. I'm out at Boot Lake Nature Preserve on the north side of Elkhart. And if I move aside a little bit here, you'll be able to see the background a little bit better. When I'm right in front of the camera, it focuses on me. That's Boot Lake there behind me. The water's real low. It's real marshy. There's a lot of waterfowl out there, a lot of geese and duck and sandhill crane, and this place is a, a wildlife sanctuary, really. Uh, there's a lot of wildlife here. Anyhow, today we are in Exodus chapter 27. Now, 26 finished up with describing the, the building of the tabernacle. The inner part of the tabernacle, which was the holy place and the most holy place, which was the tent that was like in the middle of the courtyard. I'm going to show a picture in this video where you'll be able to see a little bit and get a better idea of, of exactly what it was. A lot of you probably know already, <laughs> but I'm going to show that anyway because it'll be uh, a little bit of a visual idea of what I'm describing. Now, in this chapter, we start out by the Lord is still talking to Moses, and he's describing the building of the altar, which was outside of the holy place. It was in the courtyard of the tabernacle. Okay? So we're starting out here, chapter 27, verse 1. And thou shalt make an altar of shittim wood. Now, I said before, this shittim wood is kind of, kind of a strange name that's not really used anymore. It's acacia wood is what it is. That's just how the King James translators translated it. Uh, so when I talk about the shittim wood there, that is acacia wood from the acacia tree. And he says it should be five cubits long, the altar, and five cubits broad, so it was square. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. All right, now the cubit measurement is was approximately 18 inches. All right, so if it's five cubits square, that would be roughly seven and a half feet square. And, and then if it was three cubits tall, well, that's four and a half feet. So we get some idea of how big this altar was. And this is where they sacrificed all their uh, offerings, their sin offerings, and all those kinds of things were sacrificed here on this altar, which was in the courtyard of the tabernacle. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof. His horns shall be of the same, and thou shalt overlay it with brass. Okay, now what it's talking about here is on the four corners there was to be a horn similar to like uh, a horn of say a bull or something like that they were protrusions which were on each corner of the altar and what this was for was tying the sacrifice to the altar because a lot of times they'd, they'd put the sacrifice on the altar while it was still alive and then they would kill it on the altar. So with these horns on the four corners of the altar, they could tie down whatever the sacrifice was. That was one thing, one thing that it was used for. Another thing that it was used for was if someone had committed a sin and they wanted to appeal to God about it, they or they didn't want, say they perpetrated a sin against somebody, say they stole something from somebody, and they wanted forgiveness. They would go to the altar and they'd cling to the horns of the altar, hoping to find forgiveness for whatever their transgression was by the sacrifice that was being sacrificed there. I know it's kind of strange to us now, but that's what it was also used for. And we see examples of that several times in Scripture. Now, in Psalm 118, verse 27, the psalmist says, God is the Lord which hath showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even unto the horns of the altar. 
All right, so here we see them talking about what I was saying, how they used it to tie down the sacrifice. Okay, then in 1 Kings chapter 50, we see an example of people going to the altar for forgiveness and clinging to the horns of the altar. It happens several times in that first chapter. And the first time is in verse 50 of 1 Kings chapter 1, and it says, And Adonijah feared because of Solomon. Now, these were two sons of David. Adonijah was trying to take the throne. He was trying to usurp the throne from his brother Solomon. And this is while their father, David, was on his deathbed. And Adonijah was trying to take the throne, and they found out about him. They, they crowned Solomon king, and he knew he was in the wrong. So it says that he arose and went and caught hold on the horns of the altar. And he was doing that to beg for forgiveness for what he was trying to do in usurping the throne. All right, then it happens again in the same chapter with Joab. All right, I'm not going to get into that whole story. But there's several examples there of people clinging to the horns of the altar for forgiveness. Then, <laughs> now this is interesting here. The last time in Scripture... I believe it's the last time that the horns of the altar are mentioned was in the book of Amos, chapter 3, verse 14. Now, this is prophetic here. And the prophet Amos said, In the day that I shall visit the transgressions of Israel upon him, upon Israel, I will also visit the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. All right now, I believe that's symbolic of not needing the sacrifice anymore. When the law is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, because of what he did, then they didn't need these burnt offerings. The altar wasn't needed anymore. So that's why it says, the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. That's my opinion on that anyway. The book of Amos is very much prophetic. Now going on, in verse 3, the Lord says, And thou shalt make his pans. When it says his, it's talking about the altar. It's talking about the altar itself, okay? And thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes and his shovels and his basins and his flesh hooks and his fire pans. All the vessels thereof thou shalt make of brass and thou shalt make for it a great of network of brass and upon the net shalt thou make four brazen rings brassen brazen in the four corners thereof all right so this was a grate that went down in the center of the altar and it was to hold whatever was being sacrificed and the fire would be underneath and thou shalt put it under the compass of the altar beneath, that the net may be even to the midst of the altar. Calls it a net because it's a, uh, it's a mesh thing there, which is where the, the fire would be able to come through and cook the meat that was on the altar there. And thou shalt make staves for the altar staves of shittim wood and overlay them with brass. This is very much the same thing that they did with the Ark of the Covenant and with the table of the showbread that was mentioned in the last chapter. That's what they did there too. So they had rings of brass on the side of it and these staves made out of acacia wood would uh, be covered with brass and they would go through the rings so that they would be able to carry this altar if they needed to because this was a mobile tabernacle, the whole thing. They were to camp there, and they were going to be moving around. And the staves shall be put into the rings. And the staves shall be upon the two sides of the altar to bear it. Hollow with boards shalt thou make it, the altar, as it was showed thee in the mount so shall they make it. Now, there's a couple things here. Using the boards, it says, hollow with boards shalt thou make it. 
Um, I'm assuming that just means they used boards when they were constructing the altar to make sure that it was square. That's what I would imagine that is. Of course, the boards would burn up once they started fire there. So, obviously, the boards were used for construction to make the altar square. And then it says, As it was showed thee in the mount. Now, it said that in the last chapter, too. Now, we don't know everything that Moses saw there. He was in this glory cloud, and the Lord was instructing him in all these things. And so he was being shown these things somehow in the spirit, I guess. So that's what we're seeing there, that he's he was showed what these things were supposed to look like. So when they constructed him, he, he knew. So he would be able to instruct the, the craftsmen that were making it and say, no, that's, that's not quite right. It's more like this because God showed it to him. Verse 9, and thou shalt make the court of the tabernacle. For the south side southward there shall be hangings for the courts of fine twined linen of an hundred cubits long for one side. All right, now. This, these courts of the tabernacle is the outside enclosure. What we talked about in the last chapter was the construction of the, the building that was right in the center of the courts, which was the holy place. Only the priest could go in there. And the most holy place, which is in the rear of the holy place, which was separated by a veil and the Ark of the Covenant was in there, the high priest could only go in there once a year. All right, so this, this thing right in the middle, it was a holy place and only the priest could actually enter there. That's where the table of showbread was and where the lampstand was and where the altar of incense was and then the holy of holies. Now it says that this court was to be a hundred cubits long. Now that's 150 feet. That's pretty big, pretty big courtyard there. And the 20 pillars thereof, and their 20 sockets shall be of brass, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. All right, I'm not gonna go into great depths about it. This is the hardware where the curtains would hang around the court. There'd be 20 pillars on the long side. It was 150 feet long. There'd be 20 pillars there and there'd be hooks in the pillars. Now it says there'd be sockets. I'm not sure if the sockets were in the pillars. I assume they're in the pillars. But then there were hooks and the, and the word fillets. What that actually is, is the Hebrew word hasukim. And what that actually means is rings and it can also mean rods. I found several different meanings for this. So I can't really pinpoint it exactly. I looked at different translations too. Some of them said rings, some of them said rods. Um, so I'm not really sure. These were things that the curtains would be hung on. There'd be linen enclosing the courtyard around the whole thing. It was like a big rectangle. And the fillets were something like curtain rods or something they would attach to these hooks all right it says rings so maybe they were eyelets that were in the curtains because there were rings and the curtains which they called fillets but then it talks about the rods too so i'm not real positive i imagine that they were probably rods with rings that, that hooked into the hooks on the posts. Verse 11, and likewise for the north side in length, there shall be hangings of an hundred cubits long and his 20 pillars and their 20 sockets of brass, the hooks of the pillars and their fillets of silver. So it's the same on either side, 150 feet long or a hundred cubits. And for the breadth of the court, on the west side shall be hangings of 50 cubits. All right, now that was 75 feet. 
So this courtyard was 150 feet by 75 feet. It was a rectangle. It was twice as long as it was wide. Their pillars 10 and their sockets 10. And the breadth of the court on the east side, eastward, shall be 50 cubits. So it was the same. This was a big rectangle. Don't get bored, listen to this, and shut this off here. There's some really deep stuff in this too. In all these chapters there are. Because these things are symbolic. And you may see some things in it that I don't see. And like I said before, my purpose in these videos is to read the scriptures and to examine them. And to encourage discussion about it and encourage people to look into it themselves, you know? Verse 14, the hangings of one side of the gate shall be 15 cubits. Their pillars three and their sockets three. And on the other side shall be hangings 15 cubits, their pillars three and their sockets three. So I'm assuming this is in front where, where the, the doorway of the tabernacle is, that there'd be hangings on either side of the door. That's what it sounds like here. And for the gate of the court shall be an hanging of 20 cubits. Now, see, if you do the math there, the gate itself, there's going to be a hanging of 20 cubits, it says. Well, it says the hangings on either side of the door are 15 cubits each. So if you add that up, 15 cubits plus 20 cubits plus 15 cubits is 50 cubits. So that's the width of it. All right? 75 feet. For the gate of the court shall be a hanging of 20 cubits of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen. So it sounds like that it's the same color as the linen that was the interior of of the holy place that we described in the last chapter. And fine twined linen wrought with needlework. Yeah. And their pillars shall be four and their sockets four. All right? In Revelation chapter 19, verse 8, it says there that fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. That's what it says. So that's what the fine linen is symbolic of. It's symbolic of righteousness of the people in performing the law and following the statutes that they're given. Verse 17, all the pillars round about the court shall be filleted with silver. Their hooks shall be of silver and their sockets of brass. The length of the court shall be a hundred cubits, and the breadth fifty everywhere, and the height five cubits of fine twined linen, and their sockets of brass. So here it's saying five cubits, which is equal to seven and a half feet. That's how tall this linen was that went around the circumference of the entire courtyard. It was seven and a half feet tall. All the vessels of the tabernacle and all the service thereof and all the pins thereof and all the pins of the court shall be of brass. All right, now, here, I'm going to stop with the text for a minute here and I'm going to show a couple pictures here of what it looked like. Now, in this first picture here, you'll see the courtyard as it was constructed. Each side was 150 feet, and then it was 50 feet in the front. And you can see there what I just described of the front of the tabernacle. The curtains there that were embroidered that hung in front of the gate, those were uh, 20 cubits wide. And then there was 15 cubits on either side. And then you can see the 20 posts going down each side. They were holding up the linen. And then you can see they have a drawing here of, of the priests that are inside of the courtyard there. And they aren't all just priests. 
because the common people, the Israelites, could enter into the court. All right? So they would come there to sacrifice. But the structure there in the middle, that was covered with the linen and the goat's hair and the ram skin dyed red and then the badger skin on top. That's what you see in the middle there. And then the artist here showed a pillar of cloud above the holy place, actually above the Holy of Holies, which is in the back. All right. Now, this next picture, it shows what the inside of the holy place looked like a little bit, which was what was described in the last chapter. You see the big lampstand there with the seven flames. And then uh, the table of the showbread there with staves in either side. Then you see the little altar of incense with the horns on each side of that. And then there's the veil there where the Holy of Holies would be behind it. And you can see where the ark would be in there. All right. So that's just to give you a better idea of what we're talking about here, if you don't know. Now, that, what you just saw there, and what we've been talking about in this chapter this is the courts of the lord that david sang about in the psalms we hear about it a lot in a lot of different hymns and worship songs that we do uh, because a lot of those psalms are made into worship songs aren't they well when he sings about the courts of the lord and things like that this is what he's talking about because a temple wasn't built until after he was gone for instance, in Psalm 84, it's mentioned several times in that psalm, in verse 2 and in verse 10, he says, My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. And then in verse 10 of the same psalm there, he says, For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. I can think of one worship song in particular that's written from that, and that's better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Many churches sing that. And that's where they get that from there, Psalm 84. Then is Psalm 100, verse 4, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. I think that line there is in a lot of songs. And we sing these things. But this is what they originally meant. David was singing about this court that we were just looking at and we've been talking about. That's what he was singing about. He loved being there. And he, he could feel the presence of the Lord there. And of course, at that time, the Ark of the Covenant was there. All right, then back to our main text. In verse 20, the Lord goes on talking to Moses, saying, And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil, olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. Now, first of all, the lampstand was to always be lit. I don't think I brought that up in the last chapter. And I suggested that maybe the snuff dishes that it mentioned were to put the flame out. So I take that back. I'm not sure what they were. Maybe they had something to do with uh, holding the oil or something. I'm not real sure. But the lampstand was to stay lit all the time. And this symbolized, it symbolized several things. Now, what I see here. Now, some of you may see something else, and that's that's fantastic. Uh, that's the purpose of these videos, to get us to actually look at it and think about what the scripture's saying there. Now, what I see is that the lampstand seems to symbolize the seven spirits of God on the one hand that stand before the throne of God. You see that in Revelation chapter 4. When John is caught up into heaven and he's seeing the scene in the heavenly throne room there and he sees the seven spirits of God standing before the throne. All right, some people say that this is the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of different ideas on that. But that's what I believe the lampstand 
one thing that it's supposed to symbolize. You know, another thing that this lampstand symbolizes, I believe, is the church. Because it also, in the book of Revelation, it plainly states that the candles there that he sees in his vision are the seven churches. Okay? The candlesticks. So, I think that it symbolizes a few things. Maybe it symbolizes the seven spirits of God and the church, both. The children of God. Now, a lot of these things in the tabernacle, like I said in the last video, are prophetic. So, they symbolize things to come. They symbolize things right then, too, that the priests and people could understand then. But they were prophetic signs also that symbolized things to come. Now, the olive, <laughs> and the olive oil, the olive is symbolic of Christ. Most of the time, it's symbolic of the Lord himself and the Holy Spirit. And we see here the pure olive oil that is beaten out of the olive. And this is symbolic of Christ being crushed, you know, and it's sacrificed, which ultimately produces the oil of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said, if he didn't go away, then the comforter couldn't come. All right. So this is what I'm seeing in this, where it says the children of Israel were to supply this oil. All right. They were to, to beat out the olives, to crush the olives and to produce this oil and then take it to the courtyard and deliver it to the priest there. And this oil was to cause the lamp to burn all the time. Now we see that in the parable of the ten virgins also in Matthew 25, I believe it is, where they had to keep oil in their lamps waiting for the master to return, right? This is very, very symbolic. I could, I could talk on this for an entire video, really. But for sake of time, I'm going to go on here. We're getting to the end of the chapter here. It's not a real long chapter. And this is actually the last verse. Verse 21, it says, In the tabernacle of the congregation, without the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall order it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever unto their generations on the behalf of of the children of Israel. Now this whole thing, this is so symbolic. Now this is not talking about literal, what's supposed to be done forever. It's not talking about literal priests in a literal tabernacle or temple. <laughs> it's talking about what, what God's servants are to provide for mankind. This is a little bit what I'm doing right here. <laughs> I'm, I'm providing spiritual food through the Lord, through the oil that flows out. Um, now, those that said they're the tabernacle of the congregation without the veil. So they're outside. The congregation itself is not in the holy place there. Only the priest could go in there. The congregation was outside. But now remember that at the Lord's crucifixion, the veil of the temple, uh, the veil that separated the most holy place from the holy place, was split in half. And that was symbolizing that there is now a way to God. There is a way into the Holy of Holies through the Lord Jesus Christ. He has opened that way for us. There's still ministers. There's still people to help. But we have the Holy Spirit now. It's a lot different. Now the Holy Spirit indwells us. 
and guides us. And that is our minister. He is our guiding light. So this whole enclosure of the tabernacle is taken down. And there's room for everyone. There's room for everyone there. And the prayers of the children of God everywhere rise like the incense to praise our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time with my friends today that we can talk about these these deep matters and these things of the Spirit. And Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts so that we could receive even more to overflowing <laughs> of your precious word and the things that were shown through your word and through your spirit that resides within each one of us. Lord, I ask that you'd bless each person listening in a special way. And I thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. That's a resilient bug there because it's kind of cool out today. <laughs> it's only in the 50s. It's not going to get real warm today, although it's going to get warmer this week. It's supposed to get into the 70s again for a little while. Like, subscribe, share, all those things. Help me to grow this channel. And I love you all, and I'll see you the next time around. Bye-bye.